Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this uh, CIR East Anglia branch lecture on adjudication updates. Um, it's a couple of bits of housekeeping. Uh, if you could all keep yourselves on mute, and if you need to ask John a question, um, put your hand up, and then John will invite you to uh, ask your question. Do you want to do those at the end, John, or as we go on? Um, I'll try and deal with them as we go on. Um, okay. If I miss anything, <coughs> um, I will pick it up at the end. I'll try and tidy it at the end. Okay. Um, just so everybody knows, we are recording this session for future use. Um, and also the slides will be uploaded onto the uh, East Anglian branch section of the CIR website sometime over the next couple of days. Um, I think probably now's the time to introduce John Riches. Most of you will know of John, um, arbitrator, adjudicator, mediator, um, one of the drafters of things like the uh, JCT contracts, etc. Um, and a very good supporter of the branch locally. Um, over to you, John. Um, I'm going to say good afternoon because it's past midday. Um, just put your hands up if you've <coughs> got questions. I'll try and um, deal with them as we go. Uh, there's a lot of you have not got video on. It's up to you. Um, so there's no problem there. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do something different to my usual update. Um, I need to find a button that works. Hang on a sec. Uh, don't seem to have control of my slides now. Yes, I have. Um, so 2022, another year. And this is the 16th one, I think, I've done of these. And um, it's still a remote edition. We are going to do some in person eventually when we all dare go out and when we dare go out we'll then decide whether we feel like traveling because we've all become very lazy um i'm only going to deal with three cases today usually there are more cases and the reason i'm dealing with um three cases is, is that made things quite complicated um and there's a lot in the chosen cases and there's a lot I haven't dealt with, which I'm going to suggest to you that you should um, swap on and read. And I think if you're a decision maker, you should look at these cases. And if you're pleading cases, I also think you should look and I'll explain why that kicks in um, shortly. So we're still playing about in the industry and I think the courts have made a right mess of this um, on true values and smash and grabs all of it the concept was entirely unnecessary we could have dealt with the whole thing it's quite simple if you do a smash and grab adjudication you're entitled to be paid if the other side doesn't pay you they can't go on to try and trump that adjudication. Um, and the case that dealt with that really was way back was um, the Mentor Towers Pacman case, where an injunction was granted against the party who tried to trump a smash and grab adjudication. Now we'll see whether the law has been settled entirely on whether or not you can do a true value after a smash and grab. We will see that <coughs> shortly. And the question is, is this a decision always binding? Because at the back of all of this lies the principle um, in Section 108 of the Act that decisions are binding. <clears throat> and it says they're binding. It doesn't say on whom. They're obviously binding on the parties. There's a question in my mind as to whether or how much it binds an adjudicator. And I'll look at that as well. <clears throat> And can the binding nature stop a further adjudication entirely? And most of what I'm dealing with 
today deals with subsequent adjudications trying to stop those subsequent adjudications where a previous one had been carried out. And um, this is because there are three cases on the trot very close together. Uh, this is becoming a bit of a trend, I think. And there'll be some old bits that I'll throw in at the end. <clears throat> so we start off with Bexheat, which is the first case in this three. Um, good chap, a young barrister called Neil Kaplan, um, ran this for Bexheat. And he assures me that it's fully answered the question, <clears throat> can you do a true value when you haven't paid a smashing grab? He's assured me that it's answered that. Reading the judgment, I'm not sure of that. This is the start of the trouble, though. Um, there was a sub-subcontractor, Bexy, and a subcontractor, ESG, and Bexy was claiming against ESG. <clears throat> Bexheat commenced adjudication number one on the 18th of August and there was no want of a pay less notice. So it was characterised as a true value adjudication. Now I'm not sure that you need do that because you can actually dispute under the Act um, in sections, bear with me, section 111, 8, uh, nine through to 10, you can actually just simply dispute the value of um, a pay less notice. And I'm not necessarily sure that that should be characterized as a true value adjudication. It's simply a dispute over the value of the <clears throat> pay less notice. And I think this true value thing has become more of a burden than of an assistance. So ESG lost and they just paid up in full. So unusually there was no scrap over adjudication no number one, they paid up in full. <coughs> and it was described <coughs> by the adjudicator and by the uh, parties that it was a true value adjudication. And importantly, and I think this is important when decisions are made, you should actually state in the decision what you're doing. Um, so if you're doing a true value adjudication, you should say that's what it is. If you are doing um, an adjudication on an interim account and you're actually deciding finally, for example, say the value of variation, you should distinguish which variations you're finally deciding as opposed to those which have just got a value for interim purposes. And that's quite important. We'll we'll see why later. Adjudication number two took a second route, a different route. There was an application by Bexie on the 17th of August. The payless notice was due by the 14th of October. There's some quite long hybrid periods in these contracts. Um, so payless notice due by the 14th of October didn't turn up. So on the 18th of October, Bexie commences adjudication number two. That was a smash and grab adjudication. There was no pay less notice. And the, very quickly, the adjudicator awarded the sum applied for in default, simple as that. And believe it or not, ESG did not pay. So Bexie commenced enforcement proceedings. It went and it went against the now established pattern of smash and grab burst, then true value. We've all got into this habit of saying, oh, do a smash and grab, and then you can attack it in a true value. There is nothing that prevents you doing a true value first, or simply, you didn't even call it true value. You can simply determine a sum first without the rigmarole of these notices. So you could simply say, this is my valuation. I want a decision on that it's worth that sum or some other sum. And that then becomes cast in stone by the binding nature of the decision. And you needn't call it a true value. That's it. Um, this case went true value first. So everybody was uncomfortable that things had gone out of order because you usually do, uh, and Grove and S&T, 
was very much about the relationship of smash and grab first and true value second. So the key grounds on which ESG resisted enforcement, and this case illustrates the dangers of having either an amended contract or a hybrid contract. When people write contracts, they think they're good at it. And they are until they go to court and are told that they weren't. When people amend contracts, more often than not, it's done badly. And the only way to find out is to go to court and be told you've done it badly. <clears throat> the true value of interim app application 23 um, had already been determined in adjudication number one, such that Mr. Silver did not have jurisdiction in adjudication two. What they were saying was, because the first adjudication was a true value, that knocked out the subsequent adjudication. Um, and therefore the adjudicator's decision had no um, effect at all because he had no jurisdiction. So that was the first argument. Um, the second argument is within the ESG contract, they had a contractual right to set off against an adjudicator's decision. Um, we'll see what happens with that in, in a moment. But there are lots of these sorts of contracts out there where people think they can put a device in a contract which trumps a decision. Bexhe had deprived ESG of its contractual right to elect to have the true value of interim application 23 determined in adjudication number two, um, because they'd gone smash and grab and, that's not quite right what I've written there. I think they that they, they mean um, the true value in 22, I think. Yes, it's the true value in 22. So the prior true value then stopped the right to have another true value on the later application. That was their argument. Um, none of you have blanched at any of this yet as to whether you think those arguments were particularly good or not. Um, so let's look at the impact of decision number one, the true value one. The true value is the first problem because characteristically, people felt that everybody was going out of order, true value first, smash and grab second. It's not the way things are done. You know, do you put your trousers on first or your jacket, this sort of thing. So it's, um, there was a discomfort that somebody went true value first Bexy argued the dispute in adjudication number one concerned the true value of interim application 22. It did not determine the true value of interim application 23, which was the subsequent one. ESG argued that the first adjudicator's decision was binding as to Bex Heat's entitlement under interim application 23 because a true value will always trump a smash and grab. Now, note that both of these are interim applications and this is the um, typical procedure on payment in construction we're moving from left to right we do one valuation next month an interim application um, one month and then another one the next month so what they're trying to do is impose the true value on the first one on the second interim application and knock it out on that basis, there's a question in my mind as to whether a true value, and also a question in the court's mind as to whether a true value in an earlier interim application can knock out, in effect, all future interim applications by what was being said here. Uh, Justice O'Farrell, her judgments are very good, even on complicated stuff. They're sometimes a bit long when stuff is complicated because she explains it but they are very good. Was the scope of the dispute referred in adjudication number two the same or substantially the same as, the, um, as, as that in adjudication number one was the question? And she said no. Adjudication number one concerned the true value of, of interim application 22 and adjudication two a smash and grab on interim application 23 that's paragraph 48 in the judgment 
And what she says, although the line items and figures in interim, interim application 23 were substantially the same as those in interim application 22, interim application 23 was for, were for payment in respect of work for a different valuation period that is up to the 31st of August. Now, let's just think about this for the moment in surveying terms. If, if you do an interim application which says the brickwork is 100% complete, surprise, surprise, in the subsequent valuations, you're going to say that the brickwork is 100% complete because we build up gross payments and, and the percentages move um, as per the period and as per completion of new work. So uh, a lot of lines will be repeated now. A simple repetition of lines being repeated does not fall foul of the rule in uh, paragraph whatever it is, nine, I think, of the scheme, um, which says that you can't, yes, it is nine. Um, Paragraph 92, an adjudicator must resign whether the dispute is the same or substantially the same as one which has previously been referred to adjudication and decision has been taken in that adjudication. And the whole of this argument about the same or substantially the same runs to paragraph nine of the scheme. Number two, question two, did the first adjudicator decide a dispute which is fundamentally the same as the dispute decided by the second adjudicator? And the answer to that is no. Um, the first adjudicator to decide the true value of interim application 22 and adjudication number two, the second adjudicator decided that Bexie was entitled to payment for interim application 23 due to the absence of a payless notice. So never mind the figures even being the same lines to try and compare whether the matters decided were the same or substantially the same this dispute simply ran to there was no payless notice therefore you must pay me the money smash and grab it's the essence of smash smash and grab i can see chris harrell there chris harrell and i invented smash and grab um so O'Farrell just has rejected ESG's argument that ESG was entitled to enforce the first adjudicator's decision concerning the true value of interim application 22 against interim application 23 without serving a valid payment or pay less notice against a later application for payment because the first decision concerned the true value. Um, Therefore, its enforcement would not necessarily be a good defence to AI, uh, IA 23. The point was not raised as defence in adjudication number two, and therefore ESG waived its right to rely on the challenge. Just watch these things, because had the challenge been made, I think the court would have considered it. I think they still would have rejected it. But you can't bring in fresh argument where you haven't put your marker down properly. And ba based on Bresco, you can't do a general reservation as to jurisdiction. You must be specific on jurisdiction. If ESG had wanted to rely on the true value assessment in adjudication number one, it should have raised this in a pay less note. It was served against interim application 23, but it failed to do so. What that's saying, which I think is quite important, the fact that there is a true value adjudication does not relieve you of the obligation where you so desire to do a pay less notice in a subsequent application. This thing, if you think about this thing, the whole of this payment re regime was written to pay plasters and bricklayers. It's all far too complicated. Um, it's written for law lawyers now, but there we are. Um, contractual right of set off. ESG relied on clause 32 of the sub subcontract to set off 163K of contra charges against the decision in adjudication two. So although they'd lost, in terms of smash and grab, and although they lost 
in terms of true value, not trumping subsequent smash and grab. Um, they then tried to set off based on their contractual provision. I like this bit. Uh, what the clause says is the subcontractor shall be entitled to set off or make deductions against any adjudicator's award in respect of any amounts which may at any time be due or have become due from the sub subcontractor to the subcontractor under the subcontract or otherwise i think that only gives a right of set off within the contract i don't think it gives a right of cross set off against other contracts just as o'farrell again esg was not entitled to set off i like this bit clause 32 provides an unqualified contractual right of set off and this offends section 1083 of the housing grants act um, as amended, which provides that an adjudicator's decision is binding until the dispute is finally determined by legal proceedings, by arbitration or by agreement. So a contractual right of set off, and it must follow that even to apply some sort of general right of set off, can't trump the binding nature of the adjudicator's decision. You can't have the decision and then set off against it. The limited exceptions identified by Aiken Head in Thameside Construction and Stevens do not apply. And it's if you want to look at that case, that was 2013. That's not an update, but it's a piece of revision if you want to look at that. Uh, ESG's contractual right to elect to have the true value of interim application 23 determined in adjudication number two two now i don't like this and this is happening a lot now people are trying to do notices of adjudication where they say this is a smash and grab but if you don't agree with this this is a smash and grab will you determine the true value now it goes against the grain because s groove and snt says that a true value and a smash and grab are two separate disputes there in and they arise on entirely separate and different causes of action the cause of action for a smash and grab is a payment obligation under the legislation and the true value is how much under the contractual mechanism they are entirely separate one is a technical means to get rapid payment the other is more long-winded uh, but follows the due process of the contract so they are separate disputes if the subcontractor is so elected the adjudicator shall be entitled to adjudicate on more than one dispute at the same time now that follows the point i've just made because she characterized smash and grab and true value as two separate disputes so I'm of the view that if you're defending a notice of adjudication and it asks for both smash and grab and or true value, that I wouldn't agree if I was defending. I would object to that under the basis of the provisions in section um, paragraph eight of the scheme and say, this is two disputes. You can't do this, Mr. Adjudicate. You can only do one. So ESG was not entitled to have the true value of interim application 23 decided in adjudication two because unilateral right under clause 30.3 is contrary to paragraph eight and 20 of the scheme. I've just mentioned paragraph eight, which require the consent of all parties to a multiple dispute adjudication. And it is that simple. It's quite clear from these. So it's another point which has been tidied up that true value and smash and grab are separate disputes and if you want to an adjudicator to deal with the two separate disputes there should be an agreement to that effect to comply with paragraph eight section 111 of the 1996 act would pro prohibit ESG from relying on clause 30.3 to refer the true value dispute in respect of interim application 23 prior to satisfying its obligation of paying the notified sum and the first clause in section 111 <gasps> section one says that you've got to pay the notified sum as easy as that 
the entitlement to commence true value adjudication is subordinate to the immediate payment obligation under section 111. And she goes back to s and and Grove. Now let's do a summary <coughs> of where Beck's hit heat takes us. And then we'll see as we go on how this flower has opened up and really bloomed in the next two cases. Where a valid application for payment has been made, an employer who fails to issue a valid payment notice or pay less notice must pay the notified sum in accordance with section 111 of the 1996 Act. Which case established that, Chris Harrell? Your microphone is not on. Which case established that? Um, it's IC versus. Uh, you, you can't. You can't remember the name of Civic College, can you? <laughs> I think I can. Yeah, because you, 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 you were my client when you were working for ISG, and we cooked this thing up, and we succeeded, and uh, we actually had two decisions in that case when we went off to enforcement, and um, they did ultimately accept that the second one was outside the adjudicator's jurisdiction. Um, and then they argued about the technicalities of timing and notices on adjudication number one. And, and we won on the basis of the immediate obligation to pay the notified sum. We, we won on that basis. And my God, if there are any of those lawyers who wrote those articles here <clears throat> that criticized that smash and grab case, um, most of those articles were wrong because ultimately um, s and and Grove endorsed ISG and CVIC. An employer is entitled to exercise its right to adjudicate pursuant to section 108 of the 1996 Act to establish the true valuation of the work, potentially requiring repayment of the notified sum by the contractor. But he's got to pay first. There's no question of that. The entitlement to commence a true value adjudication under section 108 is subjugated to the immediate payment obligation in section 111. Now, I think what she said here in these points where she summarized the case makes it crystal clear now, you pay first and argue later. And that goes way back to the, almost the origins of the old act. The whole of the essence of this legislation is pay first, to argue later, and all we've done is bifurcated the payment routes by doing an, a separate payment obligation under a technical adjudication, smash and grab, versus a true value, the mechanism of the contract. So we've bifurcated the payment system, in effect. Unless and until an employer has complied with its immediate payment obligation under section 111, it is not entitled to commence or rely on a true value adjudication under section 108. And that, and I emphasize that point. Um, the bottom line is, is if you're defending and you've had a smash and grab adjudication which has not been paid, it's a good ground to stop that adjudication on the basis that, um, they haven't paid up and i'd go further than that if the adjudicator won't stop there's a recent case which dealt with uh, a stale claim an old claim and limitation where the courts are prepared to issue injunctions to stop an adjudication that's a recent case but it goes to back to uh, mentor towers and pacman um, where an injunction was simply issued before we had all this true value and smash and grab nonsense an injunction was um applied for and uh, and they succeeded in getting it in terms of stopping a subsequent adjudication where the first one had not been paid so i think this is now a strong and clear position despite the um ambivalence in the judgment of um Davenport and Greer. So my question is, is, is there a trend 
of relying very heavily on the binding nature of an adjudicator's decision to stop process in subsequent adjudications, either to stop them entirely or to modify what's being done. Is there a trend? And I think there is. The parties in this case carried out works pursuant to an amended form of NEC. You know, NEC is unintelligible at best. How on earth are you going to amend it to make it any better or probably only worse? I do not know. Um, and this is a big job because we're talking about millions kicking about under this subcontract um, because they were doing the low, just the low voltage electrical equipment for design and construction with new water treatment works and hydroelectric power generation facility in Cumbria. It's a big job. Probably why we had an, um, a joint venture with Balfour BEMs, um, M somebody, um, because it was a big job. So Iniska, the um, subcontractor, submitted an application for payment, application 24, 22nd of October, for 2.7 million. So for, for a bit of lights and plugs, which is what low voltage electrical equipment is all about, uh, that's a fierce sized job. Advanced failed to issue a pay left notice against that application. On the 19th of November, Aniska made a further application for payment number 25. So they've got one which has not been paid and they make a further one. On 25th November 2021, Advanced issued a pay less notice making reference only to application 25. So remember, we've got two in the float here. We've got the first one, number 24, and the second one on, uh, and they issued a pay less notice against application for payment 25 only. They expressly mentioned application 25 in the pay less notice. The pay less notice issued in November made reference to application 25 only. And Aniska's argument was that no notices were issued by advance against application 24. And as such, they were entitled to the notified sum, 2.7 million. So they worked on the pay less notice being deficient, which automatically gave them smash and grab on application for payment number 24. Advance argued that the pay less note was a valid response to both 24 and 25, and that the pay less note was issued in November, um, in November on time, indicated that Advance did not intend to make any further payment in respect of either application. Aniska issued an adjudication of a payment um, of the sum in application 24 and won the adjudication. So it was unpaid. They'd had the argument about the effectiveness of the pay less notice, couldn't agree. So Aniska adjudicated and they won it. So they got the smash and grab. The pay less notice issued in November made reference only to application 25. And Aniska's argument was that no notices were issued by advance in respect of number 24. Advance argued that the payless note was a valid response to both, even though it didn't mention 24, and that the payless note was issued in November um, indicated that Advance did not intend to make any further payment in respect of either application. And NISCA issued an adjudication for payment. Sorry, I've repeated that. Um, before the adjudicated decision was issued, Advance, however, commenced part eight proceedings to try and knock this out, seeking a declaratory relief on the validity of the payless notice. So they tried to trump the adjudication by issuing party proceedings. And the case is quite clear. The parties both agreed to deal with it by part eight, which is why they got it in the court while everything else was going on. Um, the crux of the matter is that, or the issue is that how a reasonable recipient would have understood the notices. In this case, no reasonable recipient in Aniska's shoes would have understood or construed the payless notice as a response to application 24. You must be clear what you're paying less against 
And if you're making decisions, you must be clear as to whether you're deciding a value of a variation for all time or only for interim purposes. And this clarity point comes out in the next case. The court will always take a common sense approach. That's a challenge and a promise and adopt the practical viewpoint in respect of the contents of any notice issued as required by the Construction Act. And an unduly restrictive interpretation is not to be welcomed. I find this a bit difficult because in s and and Grove, they allowed Grove to rely on a previous pay less notice against the current application. So hopefully the trend will change now and this will be tidier. The TCC also rejected Advance's argument that there was nothing in Construction Act precluding any pay, uh, pay less notice responding to two different payment applications. The TCC responded saying this is a novel proposition for which no support can be found unless you look at s and and Grove either from the wording of the Construction Act or from the drafting of the relevant contract as between the parties. The TCC reiterated that any pay less notice must make specific reference to the individual payment cycle and rejected firmly the contentions put forward by advance that the Construction Act is only aiming to regulate the time limits in serving pay less notices, that the Act did not command pay less notice to make specific reference of the relevant pa payment cycle in question. The TCC made this point in the judgment. It is plain from a review of the payment regime under the Act that payment notices are required to be referable to the individual payment cycles. Please, practitioners, note that you must be careful on how you do this and what you're identifying that you're paying less against. The court also found that perhaps even if the payless notice was, as advanced argued, intended to respond to AP24, such intention was neither clear nor ambiguous as, it, as it evidence by the party's overall conduct. I think I did something last year, and if I didn't, I'll do it somewhere else on form, substance and intent. And I've certainly written an article on it, <coughs> which simply deals with clarity of notices and this follows the form substance and intent analysis of notices so where's the link in advance to bex heat this is from the judgment in this context mr nissen drew my attention to the very recent decision of o'farrell in bex heat a case involving an application did early da, 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 um, and i've already gone through that so that lays out what it did and what was said here. Against this background, O'Farrell observed that the starting point was to consider the scope of the first adjudication, in particular, whether the, the dispute or difference subject to the first adjudication is the same or substantially the same as the dispute or difference in the second adjudication. Please note this because we're looking at the effect of paragraph nine of the scheme and it's becoming trendy to in a subsequent adjudication to argue that the subsequent adjudication is the same or substantially the same as the dispute or difference. And when we go to the next case, we will look at some of the analysis of what the same or substantially the same means and how you've got to get over a number of hurdles to succeed in blocking the second adjudication. The dispute or difference referred in in the first adjudication concerned the true valuation. I'm doing rather well for time here. I might finish before half past one. And that means I'll have to answer questions. The dispute or difference referred in the first adjudication was concerned, concerned the true valuation of BHL's entitlement in respect of interim application 22. The notice expressed these sort declarations and payment based on true value. We know all of that. I'm not going to go through that. Um, nor that bit, but this, this will be on the slides when you get them. Um, that's on analysis of dispute or difference, the subject of the first adjudication were not the same or substantially the same as the dispute or difference in the second adjudication. 
Mr. Nissen, who was pleading um, the Bexie in the in the Bexie case, uh, says that there's an importance of payment cycles and of which payment notices are an integral part. Stansfield QC, now KC, uh, on behalf of Advance rejects the contention that there's any requirement in the Act or anywhere else for payless notices to be referable to a particular payment cycle. Now, that was what he was arguing at the time, but when you go to the end of this case, <clears throat> he was told off and told that they are referable to a payment cycle, and unless they are, you're in trouble. There's an argument which says an open-ended payless notice might have no validity at all if it doesn't explain what it's referable to. So there is that argument. Now we go on, uh, this gets really nails in cough and complicated, this whole thing, because in essential living uh, Greenwich Limited versus Elements Europe Limited, we re revisit these two cases and go a stage further. And as I say, now it all gets complicated and, and you need to really read essential living. Uh, it's another Justice O'Farrell judgment. She's dealing with what's a complex area and she explains it very well and she lays out some rules which I will give you. This was a Part 8 claim, which means it's the lawn for now, at least for now. Again, an amended JCT construction contract. Why people amend things, I do not know. And uh, elements was employed by Essential Living to carry out design and construction of modular units for a mixed use development in Greenwich. Essential Living's application to the court followed an adjudicator's decision valuing elements work up to its application of payment in March 2019. Look at this, 2022. This concerns evaluation in 2019. A dispute arose over the effects of, an adjudic of the adjudicator's decision on the final account. And that probably explains the lapse of time because the interim application was in March 2019. <clears throat> and we'll see what happens when they try and trump the final accounting process by a decision which is binding uh, by section 1083 of the act um, binding for all time unless you arbitrate go to court or agree otherwise and they are they are saying essential living argued that the adjudicator's decision was binding with respect to calculating the final contract sum so they use the interim application decision to say well that's binding on any calculation on the final contract sum elements argue that the various variation and delay matters dealt with in the early adjudication decision should be reconsidered at the final account stage and i'm not sure from this in fact i'm sure it's not the case that it's invariably the case that every bit will be revisited at the final account stage because if somebody's made decisions as the thing goes along on final value of variations that's the figure that also goes into the final account stage so i'm not uh, it's not invariable that final account stage will set the myelometer back to naught and you start again it doesn't follow so was a decision on an interim account a bar to any part of the subsequent contractual final account process was the question that the court was dealing with. And this goes through the points in the judgment. The parties were bound by the adjudication decision on any dispute or difference determined therein until it is finally determined by the court or subsequent settlement and include arbitration in that. The parties could not seek a further decision by an adjudicator on a dispute or difference if that dispute or difference had been subject of the adjudication decision. And I get this repeatedly and I get it in serial adjudications where I'm told you are bound by that previous decision. Well, yes I am and no I aren't because if the subject matter is not the same it's not binding at all on the subsequent adjudication 
So the subject matter needs to be the same. You can, uh, and a simpler rule is this. If a dispute has been decided, you can't re-decide it unless you're an arbitrator or a court. The adjudication decision was not binding on the parties for the purpose of the construction manager. This was a CM contract. Final determination of the completion period under clause 227.5 of the JC contract from which would flow any liability on the part of the defendant or liquidated damages and finance charges. That's Mailbox, Birmingham and Galliford Try and distinguished here in this case. Was the decision on an interim account a bar to any part of the subsequent con fi contractual final account process? What was held on that? The parties were bound by the adjudicating decision on any dispute or difference determined therein until it is finally determined by the court or subsequent. I think I've done all of this. Um, Right, the bottom bit is important. The adjudicated decision was not binding on the parties for the purposes of determining the final trade contract sum. Can I just say this? I will tidy these slides up before they go on the website. I've been pushed for time this week. Um, and uh, I completed these slides about 20 minutes before we started this. So uh, I will tidy some of this up. Uh, the adjudication decision was binding in respect of variations considered and assessed by the adjudicator unless and until the decision is overturned, modified or altered by the court, or unless either party identifies a fresh basis of claim amounting to a new course of action. That permits such variation claim to be opened up, reviewed and reviewed under the terms of the contract. And one of the features that came out in the case, which is why I suggest you read the case, is the adjudicator actually stated in his decision that some of the variations he was making the decision on, he was determining the final value. And that final value then becomes what goes forward into the finally adjusted contract sum unless you can show that there's a fresh basis of claim. Um, and that follows Quietfield and Vascroft, which dealt with extension of time claims and subsequent extension of time claims and new evidence. I'll pick that up at the end as well. It was a matter of fact and degree. This is, I hate this, because who decides what the facts are in the degree? requiring careful analysis of the evidence and argument on each disputed item as to whether the adjudicating adjudication decision was binding on any other discrete issue referred to and determined by the adjudicator unless and until the decision is overturned, modified or altered by the court. I'm just going to stop there because it's very easy to say in law, this is a matter of fact and degree. And, um, the matter of fact is established by evidence as to what it is and the degree on which it affects anything is how substantive is it to what you're now being asked to deal with uh, and um and there are a number of cases where the courts have said well x doesn't make a substantial difference so we won't play at this time but then it goes on require, requiring careful analysis of the evidence and argument on each disputed item. Now, this is a nightmare for adjudicators because you're doing this at high speed and on the hoof. And if the defense is, you're never going to get this argued by a referring party. It will be some clever person on the defense who is trying to demonstrate that a lot of this stuff is knocked out and you've got to go through the matter of fact and degree and the careful analysis to determine whether their argument is correct or not and primarily that goes to jurisdiction and the advice in Carillion and Devonport is that jurisdiction can be dealt with on a look sniff basis and doesn't even um, natural justice doesn't even apply to it 
this is this takes the whole thing much further because where somebody is arguing all of this, you've got to analyze it to decide whether you've got jurisdiction. So all of a sudden we've got a new set of tasks. And I promise you this, people will read this stuff and people who are defending will use it. And people who are referring will try and ignore it. And the poor old adjudicator in the middle has got to actually go through fact and degree by careful analysis as to whether this thing has been decided before. It is a matter of fact and degree again, as to whether any matters which the defendant might seek to refer to a subsequent adjudication are the same or substantially the same as the matters determined. So we've got two tests really. We need to establish these facts, fact and the degree of their importance by careful analysis. And then you need to look in addition to whether having reached a conclusion on, on what they are, whether they are the same or substantially the same as the matters determined by the, adjudic the, the previous adjudicator's decision. Um, and then she ducked out having laid out fact and degree rules by saying there's not enough evidence here for me to sort this out. So she ducked out of that one. But as an adjudicator, you can't duck out of it. You've got to deal with it. So um, you've got to really do the two-part test, fact and degree, what is it? Carefully analyze that. And then is it the same or substantially the same as matters determined in the previous adjudication? And really some of this goes to um, examining this by reference to the relief claimed in the first adjudication, firstly, and relief is usually pretty general and unhelpful. Uh, and secondly, any statement of the adjudicator as to whether what he's deciding is final or interim or what. Um, and I think adjudicators need to be more careful in decisions saying what they've decided. Um, and you can say in an interim application true value, you can say this is a, an interim application true value adjudication. And for all purposes, what I'm deciding only goes as far as the interim application. And then it doesn't block anything. So <clears throat> the aftermath, um, and I'm going to be finished by one ish, I suspect, so we can have some questions and discussion. The matter of fact and degree very much rests on the uh, adjudicator's shoulders. And I think even if something is not argued, you need to be a bit wary. And um, you need to be wary in terms of if somebody says um, to you, you're bound by the previous decision. I would now ask the question, please identify to what extent. Where do you say, to what extent am I bound by this decision? Because I'm not deciding the same thing based on the notice of adjudication and the relief saw, I'm not deciding the same thing. So please identify where it binds me. This further guidance provided in Carillion and uh, Construction versus Smith, Justice Aiken had, in my judgment, the following factors amongst others can be deployed in considering whether the same or substantially the same dispute has been referred to or resolved in an earlier adjudication. And it's great when they um, issue a long list of steps that, of what you must consider to determine an issue. And the longer the list, the more time consuming and the more difficult it is. One needs to consider what is and what was the ambit and scope of the disputed claims which has been uh, referred to adjudication. That of course will vary from dispute to dispute. One has, however, to take a reasonably broad brush approach. Thank God for the broad brush in determining what the referred claims were. The reason for this is to avoid repeat references to adjudication of what is essentially the same dispute. That's quite a task when you look at it, and it's only the first one of a number. The fact that the difference or additional evidence um, be it witness, expert, or documentary over and above what was relied upon in the earlier adjudication is deployed in the later claim, it's called repairing. Um, 
in the in the later claim to be referred to a second or later adjudication will not usually alter the essential dispute what the essential dispute is or has been so the fact that you can take another slant at this of itself doesn't determine that it's a different dispute the reason is that evidence alone does not generally alter what is the essential dispute between the parties one needs to differentiate between the essential dispute and the evidence required to support or undermine one party's or the other party's case or defense the fact that different or additional arguments support or enhance the claiming party's position are in, deployed in the later adjudication will not usually mean of itself that it is a different dispute to that which was referred earlier again the reason is that different or even better arguments that are deployed in the later adjudication do not usually create an essentially different dispute the fact that the quantum is different or is claimed on a different quantification basis in the late reference to adjudication this is not very helpful in some respects because he's telling us what not which does not determine this point rather than what does the fact that the quantum is different or is claimed on a different quantification basis in the later reference to adjudication from that claimed in the earlier adjudication is not necessarily a pointer to the referred dispute being in substance different if for example say in adjudication a the referred party claims for the value of 100 meters cubed of supplying and installing concrete 20,000 pounds at a rate of 200 pounds per cubic meter the judge can do maths a claim for the same concrete work on a time plus materials basis in adjudication b is essentially the same claim albeit put on a different basis there is nothing to stop the referring party in the subsequent arbitration or litigation claiming on each alternative basis but the claim is a claim for payment for the supply and installation of concrete there and it doesn't matter how you dress it up in subsequent adjudications using different methods to arrive at a figure it's still a claim for payment for the concrete one should be particularly cautious uh, about being overawed in the exercise of comparison of two sets of documents purporting to set out disputed claims for two different adjudications by the amount or bulk of the detail evidence in our submissions or annexures attached to either this is the disease of quantity surveyors where we get paralysis by analysis trying to prove something with figures spreadsheets and all sorts and basically it's the same thing it is legitimate to look at the expressed motivation by the party in the later adjudication for bringing it and given and the given reasons for the basis of formulation of the later adjudication claim one must bear in mind that notice of adjudication referral notices are not required to be in any specific form i think they are now because i think if you do a true value on an interim account you should make it clear that the extent of the task is to determine its interim value and not any final value they may be more or less detailed and they may or may not be drafted by people with legal expertise they do not need to be interpreted as if they were contracts pleadings or statutes and notes of adjudication can be sloppy it can be general and the more general it is the less likely you are to get away with arguing that is the same or is not the same as the case may be will very much depend on what the adjudicator has said one strong point as to whether disputes are substantially the same is whether essentially the same causes of action are relied upon in the earlier and later notices of adjudication and referral notices one must bear in mind that one dispute like one claim in court proceedings may encompass more than one cause of action last bit we're nearly there <clears throat> I've done this very quickly I hope I haven't left you behind um, and I hope uh, that there's some food for thought and some questions Quietfield and Vascroft dealt with two extension of time claims 
and it was argued that the second one was a dispute that had already been decided and the decision in the second one um, was bound by that in the first. But this is the guidance that Dyson gave on determining, and it's not very helpful, in determining whether or not the dispute is the same or substantially the same. Whether dispute A is substantially the same as dispute B is a question of fact and degree. If the contractor identifies the same relevant event in successive applications for extension of time but gives different particulars of its expect expected effects, the difference may or may not be sufficient to lead to the conclusion that two dis disputes are not substantially the same. All the more so if particulars of expected effects are the same, but the evidence by which the contractor seeks to prove them is different. Now, I think he's taking a broader view, although he's quoted in this case, than is suggested by the case. Uh, I think he's taking a broader view there that you can dress these things up again. And the suggestion now is that it's not that easy. Where the only differences between the disputes arising from the rejection of two successive applications for an extension of time is that the later application makes good shortcomings of the earlier application an adjudicator will usually have little difficulty in deciding that the two disputes are substantially the same. There we are, the end. Um, Kevin in the chair, questions, if there are any. So I'm just looking for some hands. <clears throat> what I've done first is um, close my uh, slides off the screen there's a lot of people with no faces and a lot of no hands it was so compelling and comprehensive there's not a question left is there i can't see any hands at all at the moment there's one here harvey cook yes oh, harvey yeah just going back to the uh, true value and uh, smash and grab i think one of the key things in the world was valid application because if you if you contest that the application is valid until it's determined it's not determined as being valid so you can still start a true value application if the other side haven't started an app uh, an adjudication for smash and grab there's no doubt in my mind that when once a decision has been made on a smash and grab you must pay it before you yeah. Um, it's, it's if, if, have if another go, but there is a, still a gap, I think, a debate where yeah. somebody starts a smash and grab adjudication and somebody in defence, as it were, starts immediately a true value adjudication before the decision has been made in the smash and grab adjudication. Yeah. So I think you can have two adjudications running at once in that instance, one on true value and one on um, smash and grab. The problem is that when once a decision has been made in the first one, whoever gets, it becomes a race, doesn't it? Yeah. Whoever gets there first. And I would suggest that most smash and grabs, if they are pleaded properly, will be disposed of very quickly is my yeah. they will be disposed of very quickly which means when once the decision has been made you can't then use the true valuation adjudication even if you got an answer and that was the problem in davenport and greer um even if you got an answer you can't use that true value to set off against in, in in court you can use set off in court yeah. where you can't in adjudication in the same way um i think you've got a problem in using that true value to try and set off in court if you haven't paid up yeah well we we did a um, true value uh, so the other side of constraint that they had a <clears throat> a, a notified son we disagreed so we started true value and the defense the defense was that they couldn't we couldn't have a true value because they had a notified sum. And the adjudicator in his response, in his award, decided that you may think you have a notified sum, 
you have an addict determined. Therefore, I have jurisdiction to determine the true value. Uh, that sounds, um, I was going to say a very rude word beginning with B. <coughs> um, that sounds like rubbish to me because the, the, the bottom line is the only way to defeat a smash and grab is to show in some way that the application and the process was not followed as it should have been. So they uh, uh, and that goes to the validity of the payment process as to whether they have complied and there are a lot of cases where there is a complete defense in terms of non-compliance with the um payment process and it was a case of mine where colson didn't enforce me but i was enforced it's an odd thing because there were two adjudications and one of them stood up and he didn't like the other one because they came in too quick um and he made the point there that the effects of this legislation is draconian so if you want to rely on payment notices and the like you must comply to the letter and if you don't the validity of the application fails now that's a defense against <laughs> smash and grab and it's pretty well all there is there's not much else um and if they get the smash and grab you've had it you've got to honor it yeah if you if there's a decision made on but um, the scenario that i was looking at is so you're having an argument between yourselves and like we're, we're disputing the value and that's what is a smash and grab but they haven't, they haven't started the process. So if the process of an adjudication is started on the true value, throwing into that into your defence in, in the, re, the response that there's a notified sum, that notified sum hasn't been determined. So is the adjudication... Well, well, well that's, not, that's not correct, Harvey, because it's possible um, that if they've complied technically, they don't need to have an adjudicated decision for a sum to be a notified sum. The assumption in the legislation is that if you follow the process correctly, you have a notified sum. So it is an arguable defense to some degree, but the point is if there's no adjudicated decision which determines the smash and grab, you can always adjudicate on the true value first, which is what happened in Bexie. Yeah. So you can always do that, um, but I don't. I, think without, I, I don't think without a decision, there's nothing to stop you true valuing first all the while. That's yeah. established in the stuff I've dealt with. Um, yeah. I don't think that a notified sum is a proper defence. Uh, unless you've got a decision on it, I can now see Patrick Waterhouse. He's turned his camera on. Hi, Patrick. Any more questions? Harvey will hog the whole of this, <laughs> get free advice <laughs> on stuff that he's going to muddle with, and nobody else will get a chance. I can't see any more questions at the moment. Right, what we're going to do, I don't know how to, uh, well, I might be able to turn the recording off. What we are going to do is release the recording of this on the website, if we can ever manage to get that up there, Kevin, because yeah, we should be able to. Yeah, in previous years we failed, um, and, also and, and, and you're quite lucky, really, because we could have failed today because by about quarter to twelve we hadn't actually got everything uploaded and working, so we still could have blown it today, but between us we didn't. No. Uh, so we're going to put the recording up, and then we're going to put my slides up as well. Yeah, that will be on the East Anglian branch section of the website, the CIR website. Yeah, nobody else can have it except the East Anglian branch. No, I, well, I think anybody can access it, but it will be in the East Anglian branch section. Yeah, certainly. Well, anybody can access that. You can access the website. So, um, so just just to sum up, then, thank you very much, John. Um, I think what we've basically learned is that uh, smash and grab adjudications are totally different to uh, true value 
disputes. They're two different two different types of dispute. Um, if you're writing notices, be very very clear as to what the notice refers to. Correct. For example, is it an application 22, 23? Um, is it a pay less notice? Is it a payment notice? Um, be very very clear on that. And um, also that if you have run a dispute, got a decision to actually sort of reconfigure that as a new dispute is uh, a matter of um, fact and degree for the probably the adjudicator to decide. But just new evidence and changing the figures wouldn't necessarily um, constitute a brand new dispute. Is that fair, John? Yeah, that's pretty fair. Yeah, and if, uh, and I do recommend uh, when you get these slides, going through these judgments because they are quite detailed, and these are these I think are going to grow and become difficult points, and particularly if you're a tribunal, I think they're going to become difficult points. Yeah. So I think you're up against it, and and any rogue who's short of a defence will always play this now. It's inevitable that, that it's going to form part of good and bad defences, without a doubt. Yep. Okay. So, um, on behalf of everybody, John, thank you very much for doing the presentation. Um, as I say, it will be on the website, not today probably, but in the next few days. Um, and thank you very much for everybody for, for joining in.